Welcome to I Hate It Here, the podcast for HR and people professionals, making the hardest job in the world just a little bit easier. I'm Hibi Youssef. What we're doing right now is we're all waking the fuck up and we're asking why. Yeah. Why are we doing the things that we're doing? Why are the systems the way that they are? What is the the motivation and, and the rationale and the reasoning behind everything? That's what's happening. There are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. And I think right now we're in the years that ask questions. And this is a cycle that society will always go through. Welcome back to another episode of the I Hate It Here podcast. I am jazzed to dive into today's topic. We're talking about feeling stuck in your career. Have you ever felt that? Maybe like you've lost your mojo, things aren't flowing as well as they used to. Today's episode is for you. And I'm joined by the brilliant Tori Lazar. Tori is a strategic storyteller and executive coach for multidisciplinary women leaders in tech, media, finance, and more. Through her coaching studio, How to Fuck Up Well, she helps her clients turn challenges into springboards for personal growth, business innovation, and better leadership. Together, they're changing the face of leadership and crafting a more harmonious way to work and live. And when she's not coaching, she advises women-led organizations like Female Startup Club and Black Girl Magic and gives career advice on Girlboss and The Leap. She also co-created Girlboss's first career development course. Damn, Tori, is there anything you can't do? I'm doing a lot and I'm having a good time. (laughs) Or as the millennials will say, me me being the millennials, uh, are you doing too much? No, actually, I don't think I'm doing too much. I I like doing different (laughs) things. I enjoy it. I have found a way to do it where it doesn't totally burn me the fuck out. And excuse my language, I absolutely will curse (laughs) at certain points in this interview, uh, which is why I'm excited to be here. But it's not about how much you're doing. It's about how you're optimizing your time. And if you're nourishing yourself, then you can give a lot more. And so that's how I focus on it now. I nourish myself so that I am in a place where I can give and do lots of different things and, and not feel burnt out, stuck, all the things. I love that because a lot of people accuse me of also doing too much. They're like, you're everywhere. You're all over the place. You're doing this. You're doing that. And I, I've probably like never felt more alive than I currently do right now. And that's how I feel too. And I think, honestly, it's a superpower of women as well. Like we are innate multitaskers. We are multi-hyphenates. And so it's just leveraging this innate skill set that we have. And so I find that as a woman, it feels really natural to be doing all of these things. And again, I think that is just because we, we have been doing lots of different things for a long time. Exactly. And I'm, I'm so honored you made time for me today. And I can't I'm wait to be here. I can't wait to dig into this with you. Like you've you've coached so many women and you've built this amazing course about getting unstuck in your career. And I, I want to kind of tackle that with you today. Like maybe I'll feel a little unstuck by the end of this episode. Like I, I'm kind of ready for some career therapy. I love it. Let's do it. Okay. But before we get there, I've been asking every single guest this season, what's one thing a company could do that would make you want to quit? I think the one thing is if a boss, a manager, really anyone on any team undermines another person and their ideas, their point of view, their experiences. And that's if it's me undermining me or my fellow teammate, another person. I do not tolerate that. And I have actually quit at least three jobs (laughs) for this reason. And before I go, I always give this feedback And that usually gives me a sense of like, oh, should I leave or not? Because again, is like this person receptive to this feedback or not? So I just, I can't tolerate when people make other people feel bad about things. And I think even like this extends to social media today as well with the like in and out lists. Like, I think that's so toxic. It's like, if something brings someone joy, why are we saying it's out? Like, it's fine if it's out for you, but it doesn't need to be out for other people. So again, if someone is undermining another person, it gives me the ick. And it also probably is indicative of like a deeper toxic culture, that behavior. Mm-mm. Absolutely. If someone is doing that, that means that they're doing it a lot. Like if they're doing that in an all hands, right? And they're just very openly 
degrading someone's contribution to a meeting, that means that that's not just happening in a larger setting, that's happening in more intimate settings. And these are the things, again, that make people not feel seen and not feel valued and and not feel heard or appreciated, which again, I, we're going to dive into it, but that's really oftentimes like the root cause of why people are stuck and just unfulfilled and, and unhappy. Well, that's a great transition to like my next question that I'm dying to know. So in your role as a career coach, like what are some common things that you're hearing? There's three things that stand out to me. The first thing is that people don't feel like their identity or values are reflected in the work that they're doing or the people that they're working with. And again, that leads to them being unfulfilled, uninspired, and demotivated. And that's where it's kind of, you're getting that soul crushing feeling. The second thing is they're chasing work-life balance, which I honestly think is bullshit. Life is not binary. Balance is not it. I approach things from a more harmonious lens. And so when people are chasing work-life balance, I think it's like it's burning them out even more, right? Because they're trying to live up to this very toxic or limiting ideal or belief. And then again, they're not optimizing their time in ways that fulfill them. They're trying to do everything to, again, like be liked, to be perfect. All of these things kind of come into play. And ultimately, a lot of times, like it starts hurting their physical health, their mental health. And then that impacts their performance at work as well, or the quality of the work, the clarity that they're able to bring to their team. So that's number two. And then the third one is really about self-confidence. And they don't have the self-confidence to advocate for themselves, to speak up, to make decisions and take action. And so those are kind of like the three key areas that I see come up a lot in terms of like why people are stuck, the biggest challenges that they're that they're facing. I'm curious, again, have you ever been stuck and and why were you stuck? Yeah, that's such a good point. The first one for me stands out, the values The one time I felt super stuck in my career, I realized I had nothing in common with the executive team I was working with, Mm -hmm. and I didn't feel like they trusted or respected me, Mm -hmm. and it really, like, got to me, Mm -hmm. and I every day felt like such a slog, and I was miserable. Like, I remember my face was breaking out. My mom was like, you look, you're not sleeping. Like, what's going on? You seem so unhappy lately, and I really think it was because I was in a job that like I I felt very stuck in. And, and I'm someone who like always can see the out, right? And I'm like I, the self-proclaimed quit queen. I'll quit, right? Like I'll just leave. But I really wanted to figure out what was happening. And it, I really like looking back on it, I'm like, they just like weren't my people. They weren't my team. They didn't align values morals wise. And I think it, it takes a lot of self-work and self-discipline to figure out why you don't connect with those people also, right? Because you need to know that. You need to know why didn't you connect with them? Why don't you want to behave or conduct yourself in the way that they were? And be able to like really articulate that for yourself because that makes you more confident to then act and advocate for that when you go into your next role or when you're interviewing for your next role. You know what questions to ask and, and what to look for. I really felt like something was wrong with me. I was like, it's me. I'm like not good at this job. I'm not smart enough. And I like never in my life had I ever had those thoughts really. Like I have like a Delulu level of confidence. Like I live <laughs> half a mile to the White House and every now and then I'll walk to the White House and be like, I could be president. Give me give me three years. Like, right. <laughs> like I have that level of like I, I'm the person who like watches Grey's Anatomy and I'm like, oh, create anatomy. Here's how you do that. You got to do this. And my friends who are doctors are like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, like you could, like, you could like, never oh, do yeah. it. Right. But like at that time in that role and in that environment, I was like, wait a minute, maybe I'm like wrecked my confidence, honestly. So something I actually tell my clients to do when they're experiencing those thoughts, because the key thing there is you're saying, I am unworthy or I am not welcome here. I don't belong. And it's an easy language fix there. And so this is a short term solution to kind of get over that hurdle. Instead of saying I am you say, I feel. Because Mm -hmm. when you say I am, you're labeling yourself as being other. So it's like you are actually allowing them to other you. And so if you are able to walk out of a meeting and instead say, I am unworthy or I'm not smart, it's saying things to yourself like, 
that meeting made me feel like I didn't know what I was doing because of X, Y, Z. So it's yeah. little shifts like that that I always encourage my my clients to do. When you come out of a meeting, if you're going to that that negative self-talk, it's changing from I am to I feel. Some days I just like look in the mirror and I, I this is so corny, but I'll look in the mirror and be like, you're great. You're doing, you're doing it. You're doing well, the best. That's another thing. I mean, it's like you have to have those rituals to amp yourself up. Like before joining this podcast, like I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like I was jumping up and down. I was shaking things <laughs> out. And I talk about this, like movement is really important for me yeah. and my self-confidence. I was a competitive dancer for a lot of my life. And so like that was always my joy and I gave it up for my career. And so now – Today, I'm like, you know what? Let me honor that version of myself. And when I'm feeling nervous or I'm not feeling confident, I'll just get up and I'll move. I'll put some music on. And it genuinely makes me feel better. And this is part of that like work-life balance conversation as well and approaching things from more harmonious lens and and really from like what your psychological needs are. And it's like you need to you need to claim your joy in the smallest of ways in the day. And it's like if you get out of a really bad meeting, don't let that dictate how you go into the next. It's like go take one minute and just shake it out. Do something that like makes you feel good. And hopefully that helps you go into the rest of the day still feeling confident. I didn't know you were like a, a dancer because that I we were talking before this about TikTok and how Tori's not on TikTok. But every time I watch TikTok, Tori, it's like everyone's dancing. And I'm like, I can't do that. Like, yeah. no, to be clear, I'm a really bad dancer. Like, I just want to be honest. Like, before you tell me, like, no, I'm sure you can do it. I am a really bad dancer. But I feel like you But I love that. <laughs> like, you could be bad at something and still enjoy it and do it, right? Like, that's Yeah, fun. I dance all the time. I dance in my yeah. kitchen all the time. That is – I saw that study that was out on Twitter, and I, I'm, like, really curious if it was real or not. I think it was because a lot of people were talking about it, about how, like, dancing actually can help you do more for, like, your depression than, like, uh, some antidepressants. And I was oh. like, is that real? Like, I – I need to know about that because I, I be dancing every day, like when I'm a sad. And there's science behind that. What you do okay. and how you are nourishing your body and taking care of your physical health impacts your mental health and your thoughts. And then your thoughts impact your behavior. So that's mm-hmm. what I mean. It's like getting out of a meeting, feeling like total shit, right? And really in a state of self-loathing. You need to trick your physical body, right? It's like it's like you need to trick yourself into then being able to be confident and advocate for yourself. Again, it's like little little things lead to really big change and again, just put you back in a healthier state of mind. So I shared like a little some signs for me that I think I was feeling stuck. What are some like other common signs you've seen where someone might not necessarily have the language yet to describe like what it is they're experiencing, but other signs that they might be stuck in their career. There's three key categories to like look out for. And the first one is a visceral reaction, which is your intuition. That's your gut. So if you're in a meeting and you just, it's like a thought that comes from the unknown, <laughs> yeah. right? And it's something that keeps coming up in your head in meetings or when you're going to sleep, that's more of a visceral reaction. That's your actual, like your experiences, your memory, your lived experience, really like telling you, mm, this is not right. It's protecting you. So that's a visceral reaction that to look out for. So that's like uh, recurring thoughts and just like inclinations mm-hmm. about a certain scenario. Then there's the physical reactions. And I, my physical reactions become really apparent when I'm stuck. And so for me personally, I get like debilitating stomach aches. I've had chest pains in really severe cases. Same. I am hot all the time. Like my face is hot. Um, I get a rash on my chest. I get sweaty palms. And that's just like my st- when I'm stuck and in an environment that I don't like, that's my state of being like throughout oh. an entire day. So again, physical things like that. Are you getting a headache? Is the thought of work making you physically unwell? That's something to look out for. Mm. And then there's the mental component, which shows up more so as like lack of clarity. You don't feel like you're at your best or you don't feel creative, you don't feel like you're able to problem solve. And that's because you're likely, you know, from a mental standpoint, like stuck in a place of almost like hopelessness Mm -hmm. and not feeling like you can get yourself out. 
And I think everybody goes through that phase where nobody is immune to feeling hopeless at times. And it's about, again, these little things you can start to do to try to get yourself out of that. And the visceral reaction is what happens first. And a lot of people, again, because we go about our day busy, 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 filling all of our time, not taking breaks between meetings. So we don't give ourselves the time to really acknowledge that visceral reaction oftentimes. And so that's why it's like incorporating breaks in your day, walks, things like that are so important because it allows that to come up to the top and for you to acknowledge it. I love my little mental health walks. Oh my God. I have to take them because I take them and then I'm like, oh, I've actually calmed down. Usually I call my best friend and I scream about work on the street. I joke that like my neighbors must know me as like the girl who seems really angry on the phone every time we see her. Yeah. I call my mom. And then (laughs) that too. But then I've like started to like calm myself down and I I just, it's helpful. I, the visceral reaction is very interesting to me because like I had terrible, not terrible acne, but like my face was like really breaking out when I was at the job where I felt like I was really stuck. And I I think it was just like a stress response Yeah, because my body was like, you are so unhappy and you feel so stuck and you can't change anything. And now you have acne. And, and that's the thing. It's like, it all, it all links together. It's like your intuition knows your body starts signaling it. And then you literally can't use your brain. That's what happens when you're stuck. How do people get there? Like how do folks get to feeling stuck in their career? I think it is different for everyone. Yeah. It's because of society, right? And the way that we are taught and conditioned. So I think that right now we're in this collective state of stuckness. Mm. I would say about 80% of the people that I talk to are telling me that they're stuck. I just went to an event last night for one of my clients and I met someone who is a very high level executive and I was telling her about what I did and she immediately goes, I just feel like my job is crushing my soul. And oh. she's like, but it, it's great financially, but I know that I can give and do so much more. Again, this goes back to women wanting to do a lot more beyond just like Obviously. that job. But I think we're in this collective state right now. And again, that is because The working generations right now, so the the different, there's various generations that are currently in the workforce right now. We've all been taught that money and status are of the utmost importance and that being liked is of the utmost importance, even if it compromises how we feel, what we need, and what we believe in. And so we have been going through life, and I did this at the very beginning of my career as well. We go through life just conforming and fitting into various boxes. So for me personally, in high school and throughout my childhood, again, I was a competitive dancer. I was girly. I didn't play sports. I liked clothes. And so everybody was like, oh, the fashion girl. So I went to college for fashion. I basically just mirrored what people saw me as. That was it. It was just a mirror. It was a reflection. It had nothing to do with the fact that, well, yeah, I am creative, but creativity can be applied in so many different ways, right? Mm -hmm. So I now use my creativity to problem solve and to navigate challenges. But at that time, I was like, creativity, fashion, girl, fashion, Devil Wears Prada, fashion. Do you love that, (laughs) Great movie. I did love Double Wars Prada. Uh, I still love that movie. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, but, no, that wasn't a question. <laughs> so, yeah. Was it my Meryl right? moment. That was yeah. A so we've just been going through life just bumping around, right? Just listening to what other people are telling us that we should be. Mm-hmm. And so we're at this stage now. And I think this millennials have also had their aha moments, but I do think like Gen Z and the younger generation is really bringing this to the forefront. But what we're doing right now is we're all waking the fuck up and we're asking why. Yeah. Why are we doing the things that we're doing? Why are the systems the way that they are? What is the the motivation and, and the rationale and the reasoning behind everything? That's what's happening. And there's actually this really amazing quote. 
I love by a woman. Her name is Zora Neale Hurston. She's an author, anthropologist, and filmmaker. You know, I read a lot. (laughs) But there's this great quote, and I actually like keep this like as a post-it note in my digital workspace, but there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. And I think right now we're in the years that ask questions. And this is a cycle that society will always go through. There will just be years where we're like, what is happening? Why are we doing things the way that we're doing? But again, I think the stuckness right now is so is intensified because of things like social media and also because we're still asking some of the same questions, which is, why are some people not treated fairly purely by their identity? You yep. know, so it's like questions that have happened now multiple times in history. And so people are pissed off. And that's why we're so divided. Again, it leads to many, many different symptoms of that yeah. stuckness. That's a lot. That was like a brilliant breakdown of it, though. I love that. I think the one the one interesting thing about me is like, I'll tell you a secret. I like how I say, I'll tell you a secret, but like everyone's going to listen to the secret. So I'm going to be a secret anymore. I don't really know if it's a secret. I like genuinely, I don't know when this happened in my life, but I genuinely do not give a fuck if people like me. Oh, I don't know when it changed. I think it was like mid twenties for me, late twenties where I was like, why do I care so much what everyone else thinks about me? Why I don't, I care about what I think about me. And I don't know if it was just like a late 20s, you're maturing, you're like really coming into yourself kind of things. Like, obviously, I wanted to be liked growing up. Everyone wants to be liked growing up. But like, spoiler alert, I was like a nerd. I did play sports, but I was very nerdy. I went to like a math and science school where I like thought I was gonna be like a doctor or an engineer. And I my whole personality was like reading and being a nerd. And I like, it was not popular. That's well, was not popular then. Okay. I got over it. Okay. I was not prom queen. In case anyone's You're wondering. Doing not great me. today. <laughs> Look not at me. you now. But like, I think I like spent that adolescence, like really wanting people to like me. And then I yeah. got to my late twenties and then I was like, I don't like give a fuck if anyone likes me. And it's, it's an interesting thing. Cause it like in HR, especially we're probably like the most disliked people at any company. And so I feel like I just went from, I want everyone to like me to, I don't give a fuck to now I work in an industry where I can't worry about the employees liking me because I have to worry about how do I make really tough decisions that are best for a company and also still beneficial to these employees who might hate me regardless of the outcome of the decision. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's helped me a lot in HR, honestly. It takes a lot of self-work and discipline and it happens because I think for me too, I really broke out of that in my later 20s. I'm 30 now. And so it was like the last three years, I feel like I was deep in that work of like, why am I doing this? Oh, because I want this person to approve of me and to validate that. Okay, well, we need to change that. It really stems from your childhood and your upbringing. I will say like for me, the one thing, and this goes back to what I said at the very beginning, like a reason I would quit is undermining other people. I would say throughout my childhood and my adult life, and this has put me in scenarios where I've taken on a lot of like taxing experiences and environments because I was, yes, worried about people liking me, but I always threw myself off the ledge if I felt like someone else was not being treated in the way that I believed was right. That's something that has been such a through line for me in my life. And it's made things really hard (laughs) at times. Yeah. Yeah. But it's something like my parents really instilled in me. And so I was always like willing to throw myself off the ledge, even if it meant that I wasn't liked. If it was like, I was just saying like, no, actually, I don't agree with you. Why are we talking about this person in this way? Which again, in girl culture, right? It's a lot of talking about one another and, and gossip. And again, like these things happen even into adulthood and in the workforce and work environments. And so I think for me, like that's always been, it's been so, so important for me. And again, is like why I do the work that I do, right? I, I partner with people so that they can advocate for themselves and like not take bullshit and like stand for what they believe in. I mean, like I feel the same way in HR. There are conversations behind closed doors where I like have to advocate for every single person. And I'm not afraid to have those conversations because my thought was like, I would want someone to advocate for me. So if I'm privy to these conversations, you better believe 
I'm going to throw my heart and soul into making sure you are treated well. And the interesting thing is like, that's not the rep HR gets at all. So like when I do see social media and I see people like HR is not your friend, I'm like, yeah, I'm not your friend. I'm not because I'm, I'm employed by this company. I would love to be your friend, but like also that doesn't mean I'm going to treat you badly. Yeah. Like the, the work that is done behind closed doors by HR leaders, people would never know. But I've like gone to bat for people. I have fought for people's promotions, people's equitable compensation. I have like argued till I'm blue in the face and I won't back down because I do believe people deserve to be treated fairly at work. And that's not been the case. How do you wish that acknowledgement or recognition would come to life in a, in a work environment? I wish instead of employees instantly assuming we're the enemy, they assume that we're actually like their ally. Mm. The problem is there are so many bad HR teams out there mm-hmm. that sometimes can't fight a CEO. I have a wonderful CEO now who like listens to me, respects me, and treats me with kindness. That has not always been the case. So I'm able to do a lot. But I wish sometimes employees even gave us like the benefit of the doubt that hopefully your HR team is going to be a good one. But too many people, I've been burned by bad HR teams. Yeah. So- I don't think you can do this job like HR in general if you're also like not equipped to handle conflict. And if you don't like conflict, like you shouldn't be in this job because we have to fight for what is right and fair and equitable all the time. This is connected to stuckness as well because I feel like today there's this feeling of not wanting to deal with hard things just across the board, right? If people have... A different viewpoint than you. We'd rather like exist in our echo chamber on social media than have a conversation with that person or try to understand and empathize and and find a way forward where we both can coexist, right? We're in this space and time where we just we want to avoid challenge. And I always say to people, because ugh, oftentimes when people come to me, they're like, I'm stuck. It's so challenging. But it's like, The thing is, no matter which path you go down, even if you pivot, it will be challenging. Suffering is an inevitable fact of life. And that's a hard truth to hear. And it's one I feel like I've accepted in the past year or two. But it's like no matter what you do, there's going to be challenges. You will be frustrated. And it's really just about figuring out Which challenges are worth figuring out and and moving through? And which challenges are right for you? Which challenges fuel you and drive you and propel you to move forward? So oftentimes that comes up a lot when people want to pivot their careers. It's like a question of challenge. And I'm like, both will be challenging. So it's like, which one is is worth fighting for? Are there any warning signs you see that like, indicate that it's time to either make that career pivot or completely leave a job? If you've done the work, right, to really articulate what you want and why you want it, and you communicate that and articulate that to, let's say, your boss or your client, and there's a conversation had, there's action items that are set, if there is no mutual accountability and follow through, let's say in the next month or so, Mm. that's usually an indicator that you should go. And I encourage all of my clients when they're in a position like that, you need to set a decision-making deadline. So if you have a conversation, like I said, with a boss or with a client and you communicate what you need to be successful, and let's say that's a very productive conversation, but a month From that time, if you're the only one doing the work and following up to get those action items done, then that's your answer, right? That's That should give you the information you need to be like, okay, well, I can't control that person. You can't control that. You can't control a system or an organization. You just can't. And so at some point, it's like you can only control yourself and you have to just, when someone shows you who they are, you believe them. I always tell people when they're like, my boss said I'm going to get a promotion. I'm like, when? And people are like, what do you mean? I'm like, when did they say you're going to get that promotion? And they're like, well, we, they just set up. And I was like, no, no, you need to go back. 
you need to get some action items, you need to get a deadline, and you need to get mutual agreement that that promotion is either a thing that's going to happen and a timeline. Mm -hmm. And I know people who have waited years. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like they are showing you, I just, this, this might get me in trouble or in the hot seat with some HR people, but like HR is showing you who they are when they promise you one thing and then do another. 100%. If the actions do not align with the words, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's my indicator. And again, it's like everything needs to be in writing. I also see that happen a lot with people in different positions, whether they're an executive or they're an entrepreneur and they're pitching, you know, an external party. You have to get everything in writing. Recaps are so important. Timelines are so important so that it's there's always that paper trail and yeah. source of truth that you can go back to because otherwise everybody interprets conversations and experiences in a different way based off of like the bias that they come into the conversation with or what was going on in their day. Maybe they weren't even totally paying attention. Then it becomes a, a game of he said, she said, and you can't really track like, well, okay, well, you did say this was going to happen. And so then it puts the power, let's say, in the employer's hands yeah. instead of the employee. Whereas yeah. if you're an employee and you make sure you get that in writing, you get them committed to a timeline, you have that and can use that. And again, these are things that help build your self-confidence. I want to talk about fear for a second because I think – Fear plays a big role in keeping people trapped in unfulfilling careers. Like, mm. have you seen that? And is there like a way to overcome that? I'm scared of making that change and actually becoming unstuck. I think there's two clear fears that show up oftentimes. The first is failure. And again, my business is called How to Fuck Up Well. So yeah. <laughs> I've I built not scared. a whole career around this. Uh, no, but I think <laughs> failure, right? And I think women experience this in a really deep and emotional way because, again, we are conditioned from childhood to be perfect, to not take risks. And so we're afraid that if we take that risk, we'll fail. And then it's already so hard to be a woman already and to like feel confident in yourself and to feel like you can move forward that if that doesn't work out the way that it that you intended it to it's now a weakness of yours mm -hmm. and i think people get really caught up in failure being a weakness where instead i always encourage people to look at it as like think of yourself as a scientist right or even as a kid right like you were just exploring you were living you were learning you were testing you were playing and that's the mindset that you that is a healthy way to show up in life and to make decisions. If like something is really to your core calling you and you want to take that leap, do it and learn from it, right? Of course, there are things you can do to prep yourself and try to safeguard. And that's really important. But it's like, do it. Because what's the alternative, right? It's like on one hand, you could do it and it could be disastrous. On the other hand, you stay where you are and you don't enjoy your life, right? Yeah. So, and we only get this one life. And we only get this one life. So it's like, take the risk. Just try. Like, show up for yourself day in and day out and just approach everything with curiosity and be open to the learnings. And that makes failure a lot less scary. And that's, again, I created this business and like chose that name because I feel like that, that was always like, one of my strong suits throughout my career. It's like I I never let my fear hold me back from quitting the job and starting my own business. I had a business before this. I used to own a brand marketing agency and I had that for four years. And I got to a point where I was no longer challenged by it. I honestly like loathed <laughs> the business and I decided to close it. And I went through a lot of guilt. Like probably for about a year, the last year of that business, a lot of guilt around closing and looking at that as a failure, as me letting myself down and letting my parents down and my partner down. And again, this is all part of it too. It's like the people in your life as well. We start to tell ourselves stories about what they're going to think of us. And I think that also leads into like the second source of fear is embarrassment right? Mm -hmm. It can be really embarrassing 
to yeah. admit what you want. Think about it. Like there are people who probably grew up in a household where let's say their parents were doctors. That's what they wanted you to be. Again, they're mirroring themselves and projecting themselves onto you. And so that's the trajectory that you go down. And th- let's say through majority of your 20s, then you realize like, wow, I can't be here. That's what it feels like. It's like, I cannot be here any longer. And then you have to articulate to them, this is not what I want. And the fear is stems from being embarrassed because if you want to, let's say, being an artist and that's not what they value as important or as a professional role, that's what you're feeling. Embarrassment to admit who you really are and, and what you desire. So Again, I think it's like there's a lot of – to get over these fears, there's a lot of work that you have to do internally and by yourself, right, in solitude and get really clear on like – and just asking yourself why, right? Like why am I doing what I'm doing? That will get you to another answer. Then you continue to ask yourself why and ultimately you'll get to the source of your truth. And I think once you're able to really like have that truth written down or if you – you know, voice note it again. Yeah. yeah, I love a voice note. <laughs> and there's so many prompts that can get you there, but it's really about doing that work and creating space and time to do that work so that you can build the confidence to then articulate it to other people in your life and get their buy-in, right? Because we are social creatures. So we want to feel like people are with us in yeah. our journey. And I yeah. think that's really important too. If you feel if you have the courage or can build up the courage to just tell your parents or tell your partner, this is what I really want and this is why, and they can see you and appreciate you for that and buy in and find a way to support you in the way that you need to be able to get through something, that's everything to people. It really, really is. Fear is like such a complicated emotion. It's so complicated. And that's why it's like it's hard to distill it to any one thing. But again, I think it's like failure and embarrassment are the two that really stand out. And I also like another thing that I tell my clients to do is to look at past experiences and hard things that you've gotten through already because everybody experiences adversity. But like looking at, okay, did you get laid off before? What did you do to get through that? What did you admire about yourself during that period of time? What did you learn from that? And did that help you get to where you are today? Trying to look at the positives and the, the positive space that it created for you that helps build confidence. And then again, like tapping into your inner child. Think of who you were when you were young. And just kind of approach things with that sense of play and curiosity. She was wild. She was a wild. I was a wild child. I had an attitude. What were you like as a child? Shocking to no one who's listening. I had an attitude. My parents were like, you had the biggest attitude as a child. You had to say what you were thinking always. Your opinion needed to be stated. And otherwise, you would not be silent. And you had a way about yourself. If you didn't get your way, you were away. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's pretty much what I am. But too. isn't it funny that that's basically what you do? Yeah. Today. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's that's what you do today. Right. And and you feel fulfilled doing that. So, again, yeah. I think it's like look back at your your little self and what did they like to do? It's like these very simple things. We've overcomplicated things, especially in the self-help, self-development space. Oh, I feel that. I actually don't read self-help books because I read a stat that said um, if you read them, it could actually make you more depressed. And I was like, I'm good. I don't read them anyways. I was like, I don't need anyone to tell me what's wrong with me. I know. I know. What's wrong with me intimately? Yeah, I don't need that. I think the interesting thing with fear for me is like something that I really found helped me when I started like being scared of things. I like, I ask myself like, why am I scared? And then who is telling me that? Mm. And a lot of times I found the who is telling me that. I was like, I'm telling myself these like, these things that aren't actually, no one else is telling me that. So yeah. like, why? And and I feel like people ask me like, how do you write the newsletter or post on LinkedIn? Like, aren't you scared? And I'm like, no, 
No. I'll make I'll make mistakes in the newsletter. I'll misspell things. People email me all the time about it. And I'm like, whoops, sorry, I forgot a word in the sentence. And I think like getting over that initial fear, I was so worried about like what would people think of me. Mm-hmm. And that when that becomes my first thought in any situation, I instantly stop myself and I say, no, what would you think of yourself? Exactly. And it's like asking yourself why. Like it all starts with if you have a thought, ask yourself why you're having yeah. that thought. And you'll get to the reason and the motivation. Then you'll be like, oh, okay, well, I actually think this. And I think what you're saying here too, it's like it also takes practice to become really confident in doing things like putting yourself out there on LinkedIn or even like pitching to a client. It's not going to be your best iteration the first time that you do it. But you also can't get better at it if you don't do it that first time. I've even looked at that with like podcasts and being a speaker in in this way, it's like the first one that I did, I was like, oh, wow, I said lots of ums, what nots. <laughs> Could have done better. Like that. <laughs> but now I'm more aware of it. And again, like I still fuck up on a podcast. Like earlier, I didn't remember what I was saying, you know, like shit happens. It is what it is. It is life. Like I think that's the thing, though, because like everyone's like really like the, the word authentic was like the word of the year or something. I don't oh. know. I just think like we could all do better just like being more ourselves sometimes. Yeah. But like I also I also acknowledge like I have the privilege of getting to do that. I have two co-founders who very much believe in like building a people first company mm-hmm. and I get the privilege of like having my thoughts and being who I want to be and like having the personality that I have and not everyone does. And so mm-hmm. like that's the other hard thing I think a lot of HR people are confronting or like starting to learn is like I can't exist well and be unstuck in an environment if I don't have the support from leaders and people around me who want the same things I want. We need better leaders, point blank. Oh, that's, don't get me started. <laughs> that's facts. The I'm hill I will giving die. my life to that. Uh, because again, I think it's easier to, this goes back to also being stuck. I think even leaders can feel stuck, right? Because they, they don't know well, what's the better way. And so when they don't feel like they have the tools yeah. or frameworks to think through things in a way that is more harmonious, is inviting other people into making decisions and into collaboration and creativity and whatever's happening at the company, they regress. They regress to what the masses are doing, which the masses right now are white heterosexual men. So it's... Not great. Not, not great. great. <laughs> not great. Not, not that they're all bad. But they're all bad. They're not all bad. But again, it's like it's doing that work and acknowledging like, oh, I need the tools. And that's where an executive coach comes in. It's it's sounding board, strategic partner, someone for you to build the tools, framework, systems with. And yeah. I think I remember you saying that the founders that you work for, they have a coach. They do. Yeah, they have a coach. So they're doing that work. Yeah. And yeah. I'm very pleased because like I cannot, I cannot be the head of HR, a therapist and a professional coach. I'm like, no, 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 no. I have one job that I'm qualified to do. It's the head of HR one. The other two are two other people who can actually actively help you. And I need to focus on building this company, not helping you solve through and be more self-aware. So I'm really lucky in the sense that they have that and they work with him and it's a great relationship and they are wonderful to work with. And I can't help but think They're wonderful to work with because they have taken care of, they have an executive coach to talk to about things. They have a therapist to talk to about things. And then they have me to come to when they're talking about like business stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like I'm not trying to do it all, which is really, I feel really lucky in that sense. HR cannot do it all. HR is not responsible for a leader's behavior. Also, yeah, I I always joke that like on my gravestone, it will be like, here lies Hibba. She tried to help managers. Like, because I think like managers really need our help. Leaders and managers are, they need our help. And I, I like that you said that they get stuck too, because I read this thing about how leaders get decision fatigue, oh. like because they have to make so many decisions all day long. And so my advice to every HR person is like, when you are working with a leader and you have to get a decision made, don't go to them and throw a billion facts at them. Assess, tell them this is the problem. Here's how I think we should solve it and make it easier for them to make the decision with you. Absolutely. And that's the role of HR. It's the bridge. It's the one who filters what's coming from the team to the leaders. Like HR, HR teams are storytellers in a lot of ways because they have to get the buy-in of the leaders 
to make the decisions that are going to impact and benefit the employees. And the only way to do that is to be a good storyteller. And like you said, be able to translate very complex issues and situations and complaints coming in from, let's say, 100 people, depends on the team, and distilling that into like, here are the concrete issues and problems that we need to solve for. Here are some ideas for how we might solve them. And then the leader needs to be able to make that decision to contribute to bring their authenticity and expertise to it as well uh, yeah. and inform how you move forward as they I turn. love that you called us the bridge because my first thought when you said that was like, that sounds like the title of a Maggie Rogers song. <laughs> like she has like the knife on her first album, like the bridge is coming the on bridge. her next album. She, sorry. Me. She just released her most recent album last Friday. I'm a huge Maggie Rogers fan. I've seen her three times. I'm seeing her again once this year. So like I have, I've never seen her, but I love her music. Oh my God. I could, that's a whole other podcast for like an hour where I could exclusively talk about every single song, what it means and how it made love, me feel. I would love that. I would love the Maggie Rogers breakdown. <laughs> How it made me feel is really the big part. Like I Falling Water has been on like one of my top played songs every year since the year it came out. So I'm a big fan. I also think that that's actually really interesting because I think, again, similar to dance and moving your body, things like music and just what you kind of like fill your brain with is so helpful as well. Whenever I'm working, I always play jazz or classical music and that's just because it like i'm so i'm like you don't want to see my spotify wrapped it's it's mozart (laughs) it's scary (laughs) but but it's weird it's like i don't know what it is about that kind of music but it really like it works for me and it makes me feel good and i think it's like these little things again that people don't pay attention to it's like what kind of music are you listening to like what language and sounds are you hearing day in and day out because a lot of people now work with their headphones on and they listen. Yep. All of these things matter. All of these things matter. All these things matter when becoming unstuck in your career. We have talked about so much today. I feel like this is, I'm going to have to re-listen to this, honestly, for my own personal therapy. And I'm like, I'm leaving the episode feeling a little lighter, honestly, like just really? personally. Yeah. So glad. Thank you. Me Thank as you well. I mean, this was really fun. I feel like you and I, we like beat bop around. <laughs> They'll, they'll get it. The listeners are used to it. Every now and then they know I like make a hard shift. I'm just like, yeah, well, this we other thing off, I'm thinking. off on like tangents, but that's fine. I like that about us. I feel like it's my ADHD, honestly, where I'm like, that's just a thing I'm having right now. I thought I'm having. I need to tell you about No, but I mean, like I had, a, I had a blast chatting today and it's like I, a lot of HR people are feeling stuck in their career. And like, I think this episode is going to be so powerful for them because we, since 2020, have been asked to do more and more and more with less and less and less. And we're also facing like, sometimes we're not given the respect we deserve. Sometimes we're not given the authority and the autonomy we deserve. And so we're really combating a lot. And the thing I hear from most HR people is that they do feel stuck a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to move the needle when you feel stuck. And I think this episode could potentially help a lot of people figure out what it is about their current career that is really making them unhappy and what they can do to actually change the future. Yeah. Just the first step is pinpointing the source of your unhappiness and your lack of fulfillment. And from there, it's information, it's knowledge. And again, I think knowledge and being informed, even when it comes to just introspection and yourself, not reading a self-help book, right? Like you are your best resource. Yeah. I think people need to remember that you are an expert in your experience. And so it's important. You have to make that a part of your daily habits. Like, how am I creating space to listen to myself? And the more knowledge I can gain about myself, the more confidence I'm going to have to advocate for myself and to be able to securely make decisions either to challenge myself to stay in this role and to grow in this role or to leave and take the leap and say, no, actually, I I don't accept this and I can find better. So I hope it's helpful. The whole quarter I'm talking about why people leave their jobs. And I think this is a really big one that a lot of people don't talk about enough Mm. is like you just feel stuck and you can't make things work. And it's okay. It's literally okay. It really is okay. And it's hard to articulate and it takes time to get out of that stuckness. And I think that's okay as well. Be like, move on your own timeline. 
Love that. Okay. So people who have listened to this and are just as obsessed with Tori as I am, how can they get in touch with you? <laughs> uh, well, my tag is Tori Lazar on Instagram and LinkedIn. So just look up Tori Lazar. And then my website is howtofuckupwell.com. Remove the you okay. in fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Remove the you in fuck. You heard it here first. Take kidding. that out. <laughs> Are you on LinkedIn? Can we find you on LinkedIn too? Yeah, LinkedIn, Tori Lazar. Love it. Okay, yeah. well, hopefully you'll get to meet a lot of great HR people after this because you have just inspired my whole damn day. And well, I hope I inspire you. inspire me. I thoroughly appreciate you and your work. I think I reached out to you. I, I wanted to be in your ecosystem and I just really admire the work that you do. I love your newsletter. I read it every single week. So I am yourself. very grateful. <laughs> I like it though. I like your tone of voice. <laughs> I am just a little fun sometimes. I always tell people like, if you ever want to know what I look like when I'm writing it, it's me like writing the newsletter like this and then giggling to myself. Like, I, <laughs> I, I get that feeling. <laughs> and that's why I like it. I'm like, this is my kind of person. <laughs> She's anyway. literally laughing to herself. Anyways, yeah. thank you so much again for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in. Keep up with all the latest HR resources by subscribing on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen. And if you love I Hate It Here, tell an HR friend. I'll see you next time.